Okay, so part two this week is on figures of youth. So, um, this is uh, relating to one of the uh, required readings this week, um, uh, where I talk about, you know, I suppose inspired by the idea that youth is just a word a little bit and some other theoretical perspectives, including um, Ibbage and Tyler's figurative method, that, um, you know, youth is concept of it and young people themselves are used and abused in all kinds of different ways across different parts of social space. Um, and youth itself is a really kind of common um, form of symbolic violence in public discourse. Intrinsic to that though is that when people use the term youth or talk about young people, they're often kind of using different versions of it, different conceptual meanings of it, they end up kind of talking past each other. And this happens in youth studies and, and research generally as well, um, depending on, you know, the motivations, your research interests, your different concepts and methods. So that we have kind of this multiplicity of meanings of youth that kind of can be different from theoretical perspectives, different methods, different ontologies, different epistemologies. But also like, you know, youth studies therefore will have a kind of different understanding of young people than say much psychological research or particularly when it comes to cognitive development or, um, economic research that tends to see young people as homo economicus and these different structures and different figures, I should say, of young people. So the idea of thinking about youth as figures, I think, is a way of kind of um, getting past, talking past each other um, and understanding these differences. And then, you know, when we are doing research, we can kind of be very specific about the kind of notion of young people that we're using. So... You know, there's an array there on that slide from a different different overlapping understandings of youth. It can be different between disciplines, like I just kind of said, between sociology and psych or social work or economics, education, um, and particularly then into the sciences. Um, they'll definitely have kind of different orientations of what young people are or what they should be and, you know, how to help them or fix them and all these kind of things. Um, you know, in between qualitative and quantitative work, there'll be different figurative ways of understanding them then kind of a point on a spreadsheet or qualitative work or look, you know, more at their emotions and feelings. Um, and there's also those kind of broader figures that I've been talking about already about the moral panics in terms of media and politics, um, applied youth researchers in kind of social work and the human services tend to look at young people from more stakeholder and way in a kind of policy directive. Um, there's differences when we talk about young people as individuals or in their family or in, you know, their um, youth cultures and there's different definitely a kind of interesting way to think about how youth relates to time and space that i'll i'll get into more in a minute so this kind of youth young person these terminologies will kind of often have different connotations different meanings depending on you know these perspectives and these fields so in this in that paper i want to kind of think about this kind of feedback loop this assemblage the way that and what the actual effects of this are and these different common combinations, these different forms of symbolic violence, these different attitudes are key to the way the youth is brought into being as a concept, how youth are governed and exploited, the position of young people in the research. But therefore, these things also affect the way young people, you know, in, in the real world will think about themselves because there's all these kind of different stereotypes and figures and, and stuff like that out there that they could need to kind of compare themselves to and kind of teach them, you know, how to be in that kind of, um, you know, socialization process that we would have looked at back in first year. So I kind of want to, in this paper, suggest clearer conceptions of what the research object is of a young person when you're doing research with youth, uh, reduce confusion, possibilities of talking past each other, but also importantly, um, engage critically with how young people, sorry, how youth studies itself may be sometimes contributing to some of those governmentality processes that I'll talk about in part three, and we need to be reflexive about that. So in the paper, I have these kind of different figures that I've sketched out, figures of capitalism, for instance. There's the kind of usual, you know, using young person's kind of sexy, edgy, cool body to sell us stuff. The other picture is a bunch of kind of apparently, you know, dumb teenagers looking at their phones rather than the artwork, or in fact, what they're doing is they've looked at the artwork and been told by the teacher to now go and look stuff up and do some kind of um, critical thinking about the artwork. And that uh, photo came up a lot in comes up a lot in moral panics about young people and their phones. So you can see these figures of young people, you know, some on one hand, they're kind of mindless dupes, you know, like that Frankfurt school kind of thing. They're 
just mindlessly consuming. They're unreflexive. This is a version that appears in moral panic kind of discourse around like pop culture and music and um, staring into their phones and selfies and all that kind of stuff. And it resonates later with a little bit with the at risk and risk taking stuff. Obviously, this kind of generational moral panic kind of young people are stupid and don't know what's good for themselves. And back in our day, we did it better. It goes back all the way to Aristotle and Plato and these kind of figures that were kind of ragging on young people back in the day then. On the other hand, this kind of young people's bodies are really key in terms of kind of selling stuff, selling a way of life. Everyone wants to remain youthful and, and that kind of thing. So again, relating to forms of immaterial and effective labour there, young people's bodies and their kind of images and fashion and attitudes are kind of used to sell us stuff all the time. The next figure is the political figure. Um, so, you know, on one hand, as I said, they're that moral panic. They're actively kind of used for different political purposes, often for scapego scapegoating, largely ignoring the structural um, conditions of their lives. There's moral panics about their lifestyle choices, deviance. There's also kind of life, uh, moral panics about like threats to young people as well. So these can range across, you know, but just about um, all the stuff you can think of around pop culture and consumer culture, fashion. They're lazy and ignorant and politically disloyal and all this kind of stuff. And they're deviant. They're too busy, you know, taking drugs and having sex and all that kind of stuff. They need to grow up. And then on the other hand of that, there's kind of that Mrs. Lovejoy figure of, well, somebody think of the children in terms of the moral panics towards them. So on one hand, they're kind of denigrated, but to be protected in moral panics, on the other times in polit political figurative usage, though, they're kind of these revolutionary figures. They're dangerous. Young people are the ones protesting and upset with the world. And if only they would just settle down and concentrate on school, you know, and they'll get a job and everything will be OK. Um, so particularly the work of Sekiria and Tanok have been, um, I think, really important for kind of thinking about those agents of change aspects of young people. Um, and you can be able to see those that reading in the in the reading list. So political figures are both kind of in moral panics on one hand have been kind of lazy and non-political, but when they are political, um, they're often told to, you know, concentrate on yourself, make the right decisions, go to school, so you get a good job, don't go and protest. It's a waste of time and you're just causing trouble. There's also temporal figures, and this relates to what I was saying about space and time before. So there's some kind of um, key symbols from like Gen X culture, which is kind of, what my, what I am. Um, and it relates to kind of the way that young people both stand in for the future and for your own individual past as you get older. Young people are often invoked as the future. Um, it's constant moral panics about them seem to relate that if only, you know, if young, all these young people don't do the right thing, the future's going to be no good and they need to kind of aim up and make the future better, where really they have really little, I suppose, control over the kind of more broader structural and socioeconomic things that actually, you know, make the future. So this is moral imperative about young people. We need to make sure they're good so the future's good. Um, but, you know, the future's intangible, it's unpredictable, it kind of haunts the present, just as the past does in many ways. So kind of in many ways, young people are kind of standing in for the possible futures. And that's where a lot of these anxieties and moral panics and attitudes towards them to change them, to control them um, comes from. On the other hand, in terms of the temporal figure, is this kind of the way that as you get older, your own youth, the concept of it, the feeling of it, the way your body ages and becomes less useful and, you know, more um, decrepit, <laughs> means that the people develop a nostalgia for the past. And this is particularly expressed in moral panics about pop culture, you know, like how adults always think the music today sucks, films suck, reality television sucks, all that kind of stuff. So there's a nostalgia embedded and kind of towards your own youth. As you get older, your own youth is a kind of permanent absent presence in your life. You look back at it often with rose colored glasses. I think when you get together with other groups of older people, if you are kind of a little bit older in the course, you kind of reminisce about kind of back in the day kind of thing. So both these figures are effective. They, they have effects, they provoke emotional responses. Then there's the risky figure, again, a key figure that appears in public policy and that way experts trying to control them. There's the young person at risk, and there's a young person taking risk. The at risk figure is a kind of been a key figure in youth studies and particularly around policy interventions, social work, human services and stuff like that often has, you know, the at risk youth, the disadvantaged youth, 
um, at its heart to try and kind of help them make lives better. Um, but as Kelly talks about that we'll look at um, later in the course, um, this often means that young people become artifacts of expertise and they're institutionally mistrusted. There's a kind of labeling theory aspect here that as interventions happen into young people's lives, they therefore take on that kind of at-risk label themselves and this becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then there's the risk-taking thing, you know, that kind of particularly relates to cognitive and neurological models where, you know, the brain in the jar critique of that is that, you know, the, the, the brain's still plastic or whatever and it's not developed enough to make kind of proper decisions. What's interesting about this is much research that kind of compares you know, young young risk-taking and older risk-taking doesn't seem to show a lot of difference if you actually start taking in things like economic circumstances and stuff like that. So, um, again, this kind of risk-taking model that young people need to kind of make the right choices and if they don't, you know, they're at risk of not becoming a good student, not becoming a responsible citizen, not becoming a productive worker or a good consumer seems to often be driven by more economic and ideological concerns than actual the you know, the safety or the, the happiness and stability of young people. The, these are these risk-taking um, figure is a key one that kind of dominates public um, discussion about young people as well and has been done for decades. And in youth studies, as I said, there's also some kind of other kind of figures that we use to do our research. There's the use of youth of, as a class, kind of generations that I kind of spoke about a little bit with about Bourdieu, about youth as just a word. So there's, importantly there, you know, different generations of young people born at different time face different economic, social, cultural circumstances and their parents and their grandparents. So they do share some kind of experiences and orientations in relation to that. But um, they also have, you know, the usual deep inequalities embedded that, that in wider society around class and gender, race, ethnicity, you know, urban, suburban um, and rural divides, all that kind of stuff. Um, again, that kind of youth as class, that generational, you know, young people, all young people are obsessed by their phones and narcissistic as a kind of key um, public figure. On the other side, there's been um, attempts by youth researchers to construct their own specific figures in their research. Um, Harris's classic one is the can-do and the at-risk girl. Howie and Campbell talk about the gorilla self. I've kind of used the figures of hipsters and bogans to kind of think about class, and that comes up later in the course. Can I, can I has an array of figures about kind of the way that young women um, relate to each other online. And I think this is an actually an important thing to do in the sense that we can therefore uh, navigate these differences, not talk past each other as much. And these figures therefore more specify closely how you're treating young people in your research and um, what perspective that you're using and what's important about the problem that you're researching. So to sum up this section, um, I am kind of arguing that kind of sketching out the figures that you use in your own research is important. Um, as I kind of said earlier too, you know, youth studies has kind of problematized the figure of a young person, the very idea of youth as those markers of adulthood come later and later, later. Um, so we need to kind of think about the way that these social changes affect the way young people are thought about and researched. Um, I've obviously stuck with mostly Western Australian kind of examples in the, in this kind of stuff. It becomes even more complex when you think about um, that on a more global perspective, when you think about differences between the majority and minority world, um, the way that globalization affects the way young people are thought in different cultures and different places. Um, and I think the way that kind of youth itself is kind of cut loose from the age bracket sometimes and used as a more immaterial symbolic way of thinking about things, of selling us stuff, of making us feel certain things is an important thing to consider as well. Okay, I'll leave it there and then I'll move on in part three to artifacts of expertise.